Oh, yeah. Look who we got here. Dean Castronova in the house. Brother Dean, how you doing, bro? <laughs> Where are you at? Montreal? Yes, Montreal got in, uh, uh, gosh, yesterday about two in the morning. So, yeah, we uh, got three days off, which is good. Need a few days off. <laughs> how many in a row do you guys usually do? You know, we've been fortunate. Dude. We'll do like maybe two and then a, a day off or one and a couple of days off. It's a pretty light schedule, but we're going all the way through. We're not going home, no breaks. We got three months solid, so we're just blazing through. Wow. Tour bus or planes? Planes. Planes, trains, automobiles, but this time it's just planes. <laughs> oh, my God. Is the crew on the plane also? No, nah, it's just a cruiser in the buses, um, and then um, all of us on a plane, we're cruising around. Is Neil and Jonathan on the plane? No, uh, John's, John's got his own plane and Neil's got his own plane. <laughs> oh, that is and so I'm just stuck in the middle, man. I'm Switzerland flying. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, man, uh, that is a, that's got to be a wild ride, man. You know? Yeah. You know, I, you know, I love them both and, and they, they got their differences, but they're my brothers, man. And you know, brothers fight and they brother have their, their things and, you know, I love them both. It's, it's, um, you know, Neil found me, John brought me back in. We have been, you know, Neil and John brought me back in with Arnell and I'm just grateful to be here. So I just smile, man, kick ass and make sure that, um, uh, the rhythm section's killing it. Me and Todd are killing it. As long as we're killing it, good to go. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, uh, I always tell people, the band's been around 50 years, multiple members, of course, and everything. But you got to think most marriages and people, they don't stay at jobs for more than 10 years. So you're going to yeah. definitely have some battles. Every band has them. And especially if you go 50 years, I mean, are you kidding me? I know, dude. I mean, you know, then that's exactly what it is. It's a brotherhood, man. I mean, you know, uh, brothers fight, you know. Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers got a hug. <laughs> right now, I'm not a lot of hugging, but you know what? I, it'll get worked out. You know, like you said, Dean, we've been around 50 years, man. The band's been around a long time. And like you said, you know, lineup changes and stuff like that. But, you know, the music's bigger than this. You know, the music is much bigger than the squabbles that, that the guys are having and stuff. And, and we'll, we'll get through it just like every other thing, you know. People just gotta humble themselves, do what we gotta do, and and realize that the fans love this music, and and it's worth sticking it out, uh, you know, for the fans and for for this legacy, man. You know, little stuff. Okay, we got we got our issues. Let's push them aside. Let's do what we gotta do, man, because this music's awesome. Bottom line, I love this stuff, and so do millions of other people, man. Let's go back to the beginning of Dean Castronova. Uh, I mean, your <laughs> history. Uh, I met you about 88, but your history is incredible. Uh, you know, playing with the Wild Dogs, signed to Shrapnel, early yeah. 80s, 83, metal, that full metal thing. You're up there in Oregon. What <clears throat> what gets you into metal? Uh, I, I'm sure it's Kiss and all that, but is it like, that's right around the time Metallica's hitting also, so... Yeah. What was going on in your head? You get the drums, you're ready to play, and you, you know, it's Kiss, it's Rush, is you know, call that. Give me, give me a rundown on that. You know, for me, it was like I said, Kiss was my Beatles. When I saw Kiss, that that was it. You know, seven, eight years old, just that was. I wanted to be in Kiss. Um, you know, and and I started playing with guys that were like 24, 25 years old, and 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 they were bringing me all this this great stuff, UFO, and and. Um, uh, Scorpions with Uli playing guitar, man. We, you know, the '70s stuff. You know, not not the blackout stuff. I'm talking way back, Sales of Sharon and all those great songs. And um, you know, then, then Metallica came out, and we we heard Metallica was like, "Son of a gun, man! What, what the hell is this?" You know, it was so cool. And I was in a progressive rock band before Wild Dogs, a band called The Enemy, and and we had our own originals, but we sounded like Rush, you know. And it was a, it was like. Rushed with our own originals, you know, two great guitarists and, uh, you know, guitarist, bass player, and myself. And, and you know, uh, we were playing a club in Portland and Matt McCord, lead singer for Wild Dogs, 
came to see me at a little club in, in Portland called Enios. And I guess he went back. He talked to me. He goes, hey, man, I've got this thing. We're going to be on the, the KGON uh, Homegrown album, which is, you know, the, the big radio station in Portland, KGON. And uh, they wanted uh, they wanted Wild Dogs, but they didn't have a drummer because Jamie St. James, who was the drummer, was now the lead singer for Black and Blue. So they're looking for a drummer. And um, I think it took a little convincing to, to convince Jeff Horton and um, uh, Danny Kurth, you know, like the kid's only 17, but he's pretty good. You want to check him out? And I went and auditioned. I remember using Jamie's drum set and I destroyed it. I felt so bad. And I hit hard, you know, I just, I just wrecked the thing. And they're like, you need, you need to get him new heads and stuff. And I felt really bad. So got the audition and, and, and got the gig. And we ended up doing the, the first record on Shrapnel. Mike Varney, man, you know Mikey well. And, and he got us in there and. And uh, that was my first thing. I think the first record we did, I was 16 or 17, 16, I think, when we recorded it. And um, that was my first debut was on Shrapnel with with Wild Dogs. And what a great band Dogs was, man. man. What a great, great outfit that band was. Really melodic. Not really, it wasn't the the thrash that, that I was listening to, like Slayer and, and Metallica and Exodus and stuff. It wasn't that. But it was still Killer and Jeff's guitar playing was so different. He reminded me a lot of um, Alex Van Hay or um, Alex Lifeson. It was like Rush. He played really cool, different chords, and and it wasn't just the typical thing, you know. Like you know, he had a lot of cool colors to his play. So that's kind of what it started, man. It went from 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 Wild Dogs to Mike Varney going, "Hey, you know, would you like to do some records for Shrapnel?" I was like, oh, "Yeah, you know, so you know, for a hundred bucks, we go in and do a record for a hundred dollars." You know, and you know the days, bro. I mean, Cliff was playing in your band, right? Cliff Whittemore was playing. Yeah. He was Mike's assistant. Yeah. And you were singing in Ghost Town. It was like just that whole community in the San Francisco area, everybody playing and doing stuff. And I just went to the, the neoclassical way with Tony and, and Marty Friedman and Jason Becker. And, oh, dude, dream come true. You know, dream come true. And here I am. <laughs> Were you doing all the records uh, at, uh, was Wild Dogs done at Prairie Sun? I know Cacophony and all that, but was that also done there? Yes. All of it was done at Prairie Sun. Muka, Muka Renick, man. Mark Muka Renick and Steve Boom Fontano. And yeah, dude, we did all those records there. I remember one time I did, I actually did three records in one day. I did um, <laughs> for 600 bucks, bro. Six hundred dollars. That was a lot of money back then, dude. So I did... Um, I had Tony Calpine's Premonition, um, Rush Tribute, and Deep Purple Tribute, all in one day. In one day. Oh, my God. It was great because I knew all this stuff. I just go in and just do it, do it, do it, next, okay, next, next. So cool, Dean. So cool. So cool. Now, we kind of come into contact, and we meet each other, and then you get my band on the opening spot at the Warfield uh, for bad English. And yeah. it's so wild to think about that was our first theater gig, you know, it was like a huge deal. I recently, uh, you know, years back here did comedy in the war field. And I was like, God, it's so small. But when you're a kid, it was the crown jewel of Sam Fran, man, you were playing oh. the war field. I saw Motley Crue here on the shout at the devil. Yeah, dude. I, you know, I remember it was, um, Actually, Jonathan's wife, Liz's sister. Um, God, I gotta remember her name. No, I'm telling, Amy. She was a huge Ghost Down fan, and I knew Cliff. And we heard the the the, the demos like, dude. That's why I, I made sure it's like we got to get these guys to open up. And Liz and and Amy were pushing for it, so we got you guys on. It was so awesome. You guys kicked ass that night too. It was awesome to see. It, it was like Guns and Roses, man. Just freaking badass. You guys are badass. It was killer. And a good combination too, because it wasn't it wasn't the pop thing that we were doing the pop bluesy thing. You guys were the you know like the Bay Area's guns, and it was killer, killer. <laughs> what a night, man! That 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 band, Bad English. You, you got to think about it, you know. John Waite, Neil, you, Jonathan Kane. You know, it's, it's so wild to think about. You know, like here, you could just see the DNA of these guys' incredible songwriting. You go from Journey and, you know, John from the Babies, and you put it together. And and usually those don't work, those quote-unquote super groups. But, bam, the songwriting was crushing. Yeah, dude, you know, when when, when Neil got me into the, involved in that, it was, 
I mean, it was a dream come true. You know, a lot of people don't know the story about that. It's pretty funny because I went down, there was a bunch of guys that already auditioned. They had like 30 guys that had already auditioned. And Neil had found me with Tony and he told the guys, look, I'm, I'm coming down. I'll come down and play with you guys. I was going to do a solo record, but I won't come down unless I can bring this drummer down. And that was me. And, and I went down and I rehearsed with them for about, I think it was three days, bro. And they still wouldn't tell me if I had the gig or not. They would not tell me. He's like, well, we're not sure. John wasn't sure. I came from a thrash background, a heavy background, you know, really heavy. And my time was all over the map, man. I didn't know how to play a, a pop song. I mean, I knew, I, I, I thought I knew how to play, but there were so many nuances to a pop song and pop drumming that I didn't, I had no clue about. So I think it was the third or fourth day and they hadn't told me and it was eating my lunch, bro. I was just like nervous every day. And I just, and I went to Neil and I went to the guys and go, you know what guys, I don't think I'm the guy. And they were, I'm, I'm telling you, God is my witness. They all were looking at me like, you're joking, right? You're, you want to go. I said, I, I just don't think I'm the guy. I mean, I've been here for four days. I don't know. And it's eating my lunch. It's, I mean, my stomach was in a knot. And I said, I think maybe it's just calm. And Neil kept looking at me going, you're fucking up, Dino. You're fucking up. And I was like, Guys, you don't know. And, and I'm sitting here and I remember Liz, John's wife kept saying, you got the job. You got the gig. Just be patient. And I was like, but why haven't they told me? Just be patient. I was so new, dude. So I fly home. I do. I fly home and Neil's like, you're the dumbest motherfucker on the planet. You're so stupid. I went I went home and and uh, Neil called me after a couple of days. said, yeah, man, it's not happening. We tried a bunch of drummers out. It's not happening. And I said, okay, okay, man, just, just let me know, you know. It, it happened like that three different times. And finally, John called. Okay, and he goes, okay, you got the gig on one condition. Go get a Dr. Beat. <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the click track thing goes, and sleep with that thing. Live with that thing all day long. Play to that thing all day long. That's your best friend now. And it worked. I, I, my God, I would plug in. I'd be playing just straight time, just getting feels. He goes, go pick up um, Brian Adams. Go pick up, um, uh, you know, uh, anything Hall of Notes with Mickey Curry. Uh, uh, the Cult. He goes, go get those records. Listen to those drummers. Listen to their feel. Listen to their lope. The lope, you know. He, all these things. I'm like, what the hell is a lope? Antelope? I mean, Oregon. It's an antelope. I don't know what, what a lope is. But I got it, bro. I was like a sponge and I just sucked it up. And I went down and, and, and played with the guys. We went into a demo studio in Alabasas with Richie Zito and Phil Caffel and the band. And we, we demoed up four songs. And that thing, I was glued to the click, man. I mean, that became my best friend. I, and still to this day, I love playing to the click because it's, it's a tool now. It's not like it doesn't dictate to me. I know how to play behind it, in front of it, on set, put the bass drum on it, pull the bass, the snare back. All these things I never knew playing metal because you didn't. It was like whoever got to the end of the song first won. Metal. You know what I mean? And I always won. <laughs> where, did, where did you guys Where did you guys do that Bad English record? We did it at 101 Studios on, um, on is it Lankershim and Magnolia? You know, yeah. right, right in, the, in, in L.A. Yeah, and we went in and did that. Was my first big studio, dude. What a place! Unbelievable, unbelievable. That's where Metallica yeah. did uh, the Black Album. You know what's cool, dude? We went in after we had done our record. We went in to do something. I don't. We we're hearing mixes, and in one of the rooms there were tapes, like pieces of tape. You know, the the big tapes all over the studio. And like again, new. I go, what is all that? And Mike Tachi, who was the engineer on that record, they engineered ours. With Phil said, "Well, that's those are Lars's um, his um, drum heads." Like, man, it's, they splice stuff. Through. I had no idea that you could even do that back then. I had no clue. But man, that black album was being done right there, and I walked in and went, "Holy crap! Lars's drum stuff is right here." I'm freaking out. I wanted to touch it. It's like oh, it's Lars, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a pretty pretty cool story, man. Pretty cool. It's it's amazing the um, the you know, the combination of you and Neil all these years, you know, it's really wild that you've been playing with Neil on and off for what, 30 years or something? 1988, bro. From, from 88 till now. I mean, on and off. I, I had those, those two and a half years with Ozzy. And then I spent a year, maybe two years in Italy with an artist named Bosco Rossi. 
who's like the Springsteen of Italy. He's major over there, you know. The stadiums, three nights in a row, San Siro, you know, sold out every night. But yeah, dude, he went. I went from bad English to hardline, and right in the middle of hardline, after the first hardline record, he took me to do, uh, replace Richie Hayward in Paul Rogers' band. Then Paul Rogers, um, after the Paul Rogers thing, I I got the Ozzy, the call to do Oz. And went and did Ozzy for for those two years, and 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 then Bosco right after that, and then did a bunch of studio stuff with Michael Beinhorn, you know, producer Michael, a genius Michael, amazing producer, you know, Soundgarden, and I did Hole with them, and 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 Social Distortion, a band called Foam, you know, I, I was really tight with Michael. He kept me working, kept me busy, and then Neil called ninety or yeah, yeah ninety eight, said, hey, we're doing Journey without Smith and without Perry. Are you in? And I'm like, well, God, yeah. But who's singing? You know. And then they, you know, of course, Steve Jerry came in, and and uh, the rest is history. Now, at what point, you know, because I had no idea that you sing, and so I go to Journey Through Time sound check, and I'm sitting on the stage next to the uh, the legend Greg Raleigh, and know, you start fine. You guys do the Infinity stuff. And I'm like, I start looking around like, hey, what the fuck? Dean is singing that. How, <laughs> at, at, what, at what point did you start singing in your career? And did you realize that you could do the Steve Perry stuff? Well, you know, dude, when I was 11, uh, you know, I, and a lot of, I do this, I say this in a lot of interviews. I was 11, I was playing with guys 24 and they brought, they literally brought the infinity, the actual 33 and a third, the vinyl. I didn't have the cover. They said, here's the vinyl, here, learn La Dude. So I learned, I thought it was a girl singing. I did, I'm young, 11 years old, I had no idea. And um, I learned the song and, and they're like, well, you know, you try and sing it. Cause I, I, could, I was young, I hadn't hit puberty yet, I was 11. So I was hitting these notes and that's when, I mean, Perry was my vocal guy. I mean, I from then on, I was like, Steve Perry is the best singer on the planet. It was him. Paul Stanley and Ronnie Dio. Those were my three, like, favorite singers of all time, man. Definitely Steve Perry. I mean, first it was Paul Stanley, of course. And then Perry and then Ronnie Dio. Just what a, what a voice. So that's where I learned to, to sing the Journey stuff was I love Journey. Even though I was in a metal band and Wild Dogs was metal, they would always ask us in interviews, well, what do you listen to? What's your guilty pleasure? And me and the guitarist always say Journey. And they're like, turn the, the thing off. You can't say Journey. You know, they turn the, the literally... Turn off the tape recorder. Like, man, if you don't, if you're not a musician, you don't get it. If you, you know, because Journey, the, the players are perfect in that band. There's not one guy in that band that sucks. Bottom line, you know. So we would always say Journey. So Journey was always huge for me, a huge influence. Steve Smith. When I heard, dude, when I heard the Capture Soul, I heard him on all the records and stuff, Departure and and stuff like that. I heard him on all those records. But when the Capture Drum Solo came out, and I heard that Dean, I mean, it was like. What in the hell? This guy kicks hat. He was amazing. I mean, I'd never heard that kind of playing. I'd Bozio, you know, and, and Neil Peart, but Smith, man, having the groove that he had, but still, the, when he did his solo, man, I was like, man, I got to learn that stuff. So I was taking all of his stuff back then, dude, and, and, and playing his, trying to do his licks in metal bands, in like at warp speed, you know, the, the drum lick on where, you know, the where were, you know, speed it up. Nobody did that. So I was taking Smith stuff and putting it in metal songs. So that, and that's kind of where I got that, that thing, you know, so Journey was huge. And for me to sing the stuff, it was, that came by happenstance, man. That was something, you know, Steve was having issues with his voice, Steve I. Jerry, in 2006. And uh, we were doing it, we were opening for Def Leppard. And um, it was like, um, Steve, his voice is kind of toasted right now. Can you sing the the hit? And I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. You know, okay. Yeah, and, you know, behind the kit, I'll try. And they said, we don't have the mic for that yet. I mean, your background mic, like, it's not going to be clear enough. It's going to sound like hell. You're going to have to come up front. One time, I did it once, Dean, and that was enough. <laughs> yeah. I remember lifting my hands on open arm, my arms, like so. Now I come like, and it was shaking, like yeah, no, that is not gonna happen. First time and last time I ever did that with Journey, I it scared the hell out of me, dude. 
scared the hell out of me. I will never do that again. But that was it. I got thrown into it. Then it was like, well, do Mother Father. So I started doing songs that that were T-shirt songs or bathroom songs. You know, tell me you know, give Steve a break, and and people would go buy T-shirt and stuff, and, and I would do the, my little song, you know, one or two. So that was and, it. And so, did you start to take some lessons for longevity and warming up and all that? How did that come about, or you just go for it? I just go for it, dude. For me, it's like um, now, especially. I mean, but when I was in the band, you know, with, with Arnell and, and Steve and Jerry and everything, the the first six or seven songs, I would just be singing backgrounds because that was my warm up. I'd be playing and singing. Everything warms up up here when you're playing, right? And you're singing, so I got all the blood and everything running right in this area here anyway. So by the third or fourth song, my voice is warmed up, singing all the high backgrounds. So when it was time to sing the lead part for like Mother Father, I was six, seven songs into the set. I was like. Boom, it was wide open, it was effortless, and I was able to do it. Now, I could never do, never do what Arnell does, never do what Steve Jerry did, never do what Steve Perry did. I'm, I'm not tested in that. The journey through time thing, it worked because we did a show, and then we had like a week off. <laughs> and then we did a show and had a week off. So I had time to heal. I've never done like four shows in a row back to back, like how Arnell does and how Steve did back in the day. I don't know if I could. I, I honestly, It's never been tried. And with, with Journey Through Time, we did, I think we did 24, 25 songs. And I was singing lead on all that stuff and playing drums. So um, I got through it, but it, boy, the next day I could tell. It was ever the three hour show. So I'm like, eh. you know, and I'm smoking too. So that's not even, it's like, hello, maybe I should quit smoking. You know, I still haven't done that. But I don't know if I could do that. But that's that's kind of how it started was, was when Stevie lost his voice on the Def Leppard tour. So, you know, it was... um. That was it, man, and here I am today. Now you were rocking with Journey for years, and then you had a uh, a little spin out on drugs. Were you on oh, yeah. drugs for a long time, or did you just start partying out of nowhere? You know, dude, I I was completely clean um, all up until Ozzy. I hadn't touched anything, man. I I mean, I was a little Christian kid, so I didn't. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't partying. And when I got fired from Ozzy, dude, I went into a tailspin. I was so devastated by it. I mean, it it really messed with me. And I thought that was it. I mean, I was in Ozzy. I'd reached the pinnacle, right? I got fired from Ozzy and I thought, well, okay, I'm done. And I remember telling my wife at the time, I'm saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I've done what I can do. I've, I've done it. I'm out. You know, and she's like, oh, no, 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 no. And people are like, you don't see the big picture. But I started smoking weed. And then we went to freaking blow. And then, um, yeah, it just on and off. It was on and off, doing the stuff and then, you know, cleaning up for a year and then doing drugs again and cleaning up for six months. And it, it became a functioning addict, dude, where I would use, uh, I would use until about a month before I'd have to go on the road with, with Journey and then clean up, get myself together, go on the road, nothing on the road, man. I made damn sure until I got to Europe. There was one time when I drank way too much uh, before a show one night, I, like, and the next morning I was in the hospital. I almost like alcohol poisoning, and so that was my second, first stint into rehab. You know, so I had five stints in rehab. Dude, so I was, you know, on and off and on and off. And um, yeah, this last spin out that scared me straight. I mean, I, I mean, all hell broke loose, and um, yeah, it was bad, bro. It was bad, but you know. Uh, it probably was the best thing that ever, I mean, I wouldn't be alive had that not happened. I, I was, I was on the brink, dude. I was on the brink. I was 160 pounds when I entered rehab. I was a mess, you know, 26 day meth run. And I don't remember 90% of what happened. It was, I was in a cloud, bro. And I got to thank, you know, Deidre, you know, my girl that went through all that freaking hell with me. And she stayed. She's like, you know, this is not him. She knew me, dude. We were young. I've known her since she was 14. I was 19. Our families knew each other. We grew up in the same town together. We knew each other. It's like, this is not him. This is not him. This is him on fucked up. This is him on drugs. This is not who he is. You know, and um, I spent 15 days in jail. And um, they got me out, put me into treatment for 90 days. And it was, it was, I didn't want to leave, bro. It was so safe. And so I felt like, God, I'm alive again. But then I got to come out and I've got to deal with the world, you know, and all the the, the stuff that had happened. And I didn't want to, you know, it had been easier for me 
to go out and numb again and just go screw it, man. I don't want to know. Check out. Maybe I'll overdose, hopefully. But, you know, God gave me that power and I, and I dusted myself off as hard as it was. And I had good people behind me. You know, my ex-wife, Shelly, um, my other ex-wife, Julie, had two, two ex-wives. <laughs> Grant, still very close with them. Uh, Dee Dee, her family, my kids, um, you know, Doug and Jack. You know, they stood by me when nobody else wanted to give me the time of day. They were like, you know what? He screwed up. People screw up. You know, got him some slack. It was horrible. It was heinous. But God, you know, if anybody should have quit and said, screw you, it was Deidre. But she knew. It's like that. God, he's you know, look when I'm, you know, they say instant asshole, just that alcohol, instant douchebag, just that drugs. I mean, that's, you know. It's not an excuse, but it was a factor. <laughs> you know what I mean? No excuse for what I did. I was a nightmare. I was a mess. Um, but I, I, I'm I, glad that I had people that knew who I was and knew that wasn't me, man. I mean, I don't know what how other people would react on 26 days on methamphetamine. That's how I reacted. Wow. It was I, horrible. I, it was horrible. I, I did seven days and it was absolutely fucking insanity. I can't even imagine because the human mind without sleep it is so fucking crazy what happens to your brain. You're just like, sure. I remember I was in the back of a pickup truck going to the Russian River to like go swimming. And I <laughs> I swore I fell out of the truck. I was like, oh, really? oh. And, and you know, I was, you know, seven day runner, man, but 26 days. No, yeah, sleep. dude. It was like I maybe slept six. If you put all the days together, there was probably like one of maybe. I don't know, 20, 24, 36, whatever hours where I slept. I was seeing stuff in the floors. I actually thought that Deidre would be writing in my hardwood floors while I'm partying. I know I'd come back in another room and there was, I could see sentences in, in the in the floors, bro. I I would look at my video cameras and I could see like the, the trash cans turned into animated creatures. It was, man, it was horrendous. It was freaking bad. Bad, bad, bad. And um, I mean, once you, oh, dude. Once you get cleaned up, you're just chilling. Steve Smith is back in Journey, and they're doing that run. And then, of course, the uh, fallout happens again. And yeah. at, did they audition anybody else, or does Neil just call you and say, hey, dude, are you good? Let's do this yeah. again. How's it happen? Well, you know what? What happened was... Uh, um, Neely called me, he goes, what are you doing, bro? And this is when I was working with Jason Sheff and, and Jay DeMarcus, Generation Radio. We were putting a, a record together, like a country rock thing, and things were going smooth, and it was good. And I said, well, I'm doing this thing with, with uh, Jay and Jason. He goes, oh, you know, well, that's great, man. It's good to hear you work in. And I said, so what's going to happen with, with you and Smith? And, and, and everything goes, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to go in a different direction. You know, I, I talked to, to John, and John just wasn't sure that if he wanted to bring you back at that time or not at that point. And um, I said, dude, I understand completely. He goes, he just wants to move forward. I said, dude, I'm all good with you. God bless you guys, man. And they got Narda. Narda was playing. Who's <laughs> Narda Michael Walton. He said, God, you know, I was like, well, you picked a monster. Um, and uh, so they started with, with Narda and I think they had about a year to get the songs together and they started rehearsing and stuff. And, and uh, Narda was having issues like remembering everything. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what was happening, but he was he, he just couldn't like. There's a lot of songs, man. There's a lot of stuff, and I think I think Narda, Narda approached it more like a jazz fusion guy. Like I'm just gonna win and play, you know. Not realizing, I, I think he didn't realize. Maybe he did. I don't know. I don't know the whole story, but it was I, he wasn't doing the songs like they they need to be done. You know, there's certain breaks and there's certain things and certain signature licks that Smith did that needed to be there and. And I knew what he's just, he's not catching it for some reason. And I'm like, well, and they, so this is basically what happened. My mother had passed away uh, July 19th of 2021, bro. Um, and uh, that next morning, I was up pretty much all night, you know, just heartbroken and crying and couldn't sleep, wake up seeing mom. And, and I get a text, I go to, to the bathroom and I see a text at seven in the morning. That's my time, 7 a.m. Uh, he was in he was in Chicago. He goes, Dino, what are you doing? He goes, um, Narda's having issues. Uh, can you come out um, and help him? We got two shows. We got a show at the Agora Ballroom in Chicago, and then we got Lollapalooza. Can you help him come out and just teach him, you know, just kind of show him the songs? And I said, well, you know, obviously I was like, bro, um, Mama died last night. 
you know, and he said, oh, you know, of course, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I was in a daze. I was just like, you know, did mom have something to do with this? I mean, my God, and she goes home and goes to be with God and, and I get a call and um, let's just give me a day, bro. Just give me a day and, and, and we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll try and get out there. I'll get, I'll get out there. I'll help you guys out. So I go down, go down there and, and there's two drum sets. And of course I walk in and everybody's crying, man. I'm crying. The town crier. It was just like, Oh my God. I, I never thought in a million years I'd even be in the same room with you guys again, let alone doing a couple shows and, and helping out, you know, just thank you for allowing me to come back in. And um, John Kane, you know, Neil had to convince John. He's like, you know what, bro? I know he had his past and his stuff, but we don't really have much, many options here. You know, we, we got to do these shows and, and Dean knows the stuff. So, um, you know, John, thank God he and Arnell, uh, you know, with Neil's talking to him, said, yeah, okay, let's, let's see how it goes. And uh, I, I had worked with, with um, Narda like probably eight days, you know, just helping him get in. And he was still having some issues, you know, but, but Neil decided, well, you know what, let's just do two drummers. Let's see what that's like. And I was like, that would be pretty bad. You got the monster drummer, you know, Narda, who's the fused king. And then you got me that's just, you know, I'll just keep the groove and let him go. You know, I'll do the songs like the record and let Narda just do his thing, man. And um, it worked. Uh, um, the two shows, thank God, it worked really good. And, and everybody seemed to like it. And um, it started going good. I mean, thought, we thought this is going to be cool. We had to figure out, well, Dean's on an electronic drum set, which I hated. You know, I'm not a big electronic drum set fan as it is. So for me, it was like, I want a real drum kit. I want a real drum set. But, you know, it was like, well, actually it works because with my, the way the, the B drums are set up is very tight, very precise. And I was just locked to the click. It was like, you know, Dean playing a loop of the songs, you know. I knew all the lyrics, all the beats, and, and the artist could just kind of freely flow with this stuff. And um, it, it worked out good for a while. And then I think Neil just decided, well, you know what? I, it's They just decided to go with, the, make it five piece. And I think Narda, you know, since he produced the record with Randy Jackson and Neil and them, that he thought, well, maybe it's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to be with my family, do some stuff with Jeff Beck. He was doing things with Jeff Beck, you know, things to do. And so he decided to to, to back out. And and I, 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 I remember finding out, dude, I didn't even know. But Neil told me, well, Neil didn't tell me. I had been in rehearsals three days, three days. And Neil, you know, you know, said, oh, it sounds great. It sounds great, Dino. So glad you're here. I wake up one morning. It was on a Wednesday. I got in on a Sunday. So Wednesday, I wake up in the morning and I, my texts are blowing up. I'm like, you know, so I'm looking to, congratulations, you know, to get the journey. Thanks. Well, it's only for a couple of shows, you guys. It's just no big, you know, I'm just helping out. And no, dude, have you looked at Ultimate Clocker, Classic Rock and, 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 uh, uh, blabber mouth. I'm like, no, I just woke up. And there it was. Uh, Neil confirms that Dean is back in the band. So I found out <laughs> after everybody else knew. So I had to call Neil and go, dude, is this for real? He goes, yeah, man, this is for real. I said, well, gee, thanks for telling me. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> wow. And wow. here we are. Yeah, dude, it was pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing. It's like, mama, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, my God. You know, I've been in a lot of bands. I've done a lot of things, but I've never felt more at home than with these guys. I just, I love the music. And and again, I have a, I have a real, you know, it's hard for me to separate business and, and brotherhood. You know, I've never been able to do that. I always, once I'm in, especially 17, 18 years with a band and with Neil and John, it's like, I couldn't separate that. So for me to come back, it wasn't just being back in Journey, it was being back with brothers and, and the, the beautiful music that we made and the, the, the music I got to share with them. It was, it was heavy. It wasn't just a gig. Let's talk about something that really was special to me to see last week was Greg Raleigh stepping back on stage in Austin, Texas and doing five classic, you know, four classic journeys in the, in the, the Black Magic Woman and then doing the, you know, the last song, Hurrah with the whole band. That to me, you know, I think that I've said this and I've said it over and over. I've seen a couple thousand shows in my life. And uh, in 78, I saw journey on the infinity tour and I saw the journey through time. And those two gigs still stay deep in my heart journey through time. And to see Greg Raleigh and you up there and the fans in an arena getting to yeah. hear what it would have been like in 78 
you know, 79 of just hearing that stuff, you know, uh, especially. Dude, it was amazing for me, Dino. I mean, it really oh. was. I mean, Greg is a legend. And, oh. and to work with him and Neil together on that stage, I mean, in Journey Through Time, I was in awe. I was fanboy, dude. I'm, you know, I'm just like, oh my God, Greg Rowling. What was it like to do this? And what was it like? I was just picking his brain when, when Journey Through Time happened because I was so excited. It's like, now I've worked with everybody but The Voice. I've worked with everybody in Journey except The Voice, man. And, and oh, it's just such a humble man. It's so talented and dude, legendary. Legendary. And, and the cool thing is the way that Greg is with Neil is the way I am with Neil. You see what I mean? Greg was the mentor, snagged Neil, you know, from school and took him. And that's kind of what Neil did with me. So I have a kindred thing with Neil big time. And also with Greg, because it's like, now Greg's like the grandpa, you know? <laughs> Grandpa's son and the little guy, you know? It was just so cool, bro. He's a, he's a legend and he's so talented. And I got to sing those songs with him again, which I love for Journey Through Time. But dude, it was like, I kept looking over like, smiling like, Dude, remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what was blowing me away was how incredible your feel was. It was like way, it was way laid back. When the sun beat there, just like standing in the light. You're just like back there, just perfect 70s oh. feel, man. You know, yeah, it's you know pocket. Yeah. That's, you know, and that's what I learned. And I, the beautiful thing was on that older stuff, Greg was, he helped me a lot when we did Journey Through Time. Cause it was like, well, you know, Ainsley had this field thing that he, and he was, Greg was showing me this stuff. Like he would pull back here. He was just pull back a little right here. I'm like, okay. And I listen, he goes, listen back to the record. Listen back. I hear it. I get it. I get it. It was a very English thing. The, the drummers in England were like that, you know, Mitch Mitchell and guys like that, Ginger Baker, they had that thing where they could, you know, they manipulated the time to make it feel good, soar when it needed to soar and pull when it needed to pull. Unbelievable stuff. And Greg taught me that. Um, so when we were doing the songs in Earth, was, I just kept looking over like, oh, man, when the summer's gone, you be there. It's like, I just knew where that, you know, and it just, Felt good, dude. I mean, just playing those old songs, it brought back my childhood, obviously. But it, it's there's a certain texture and color to those songs. They, they're completely different from, obviously, John Cain's brilliant stuff. You know, both are brilliant, brilliant time periods. And, and that stuff is so, it's a very 70s thing, but it's, and it's just, it felt, I guess the word's gooey. You know what I mean? That gooey thing where it's just oh, you know yeah. you know what i mean you just want to you know you want to dance to it it had that that thing to it with perry's voice yeah oh perry and greg together on un unmatched on apparel nobody touches it unbelievable oh. yeah. let's let's talk a little bit about well uh, what you got going on right now you got journey but then you've got some music coming out let's get into that yeah revolution saints bro it's um new record coming out called eagle flight uh got a couple new members um Joel Hoekstra from White Snake fame and Night Ranger fame, monster player, Trans Siberian Orchestra as well, and then Jeff Pilsen, our you know our you know our Bay Area guy, man from Cinema. Remember Cinema? Oh yeah, yeah, and he plays in Foreigner now. I had him on the show. I had him on the show. Yeah. Doc Black guy, dude. Yes, all that good stuff, man. Great, great player. You know when when uh, Jack and Doug decided to to you know, part ways or to, to go their separate ways, they stay separate ways, but, um, you know, Serafina was like, well, what about um, Joel Hoekstra? And I think Doug was the one that that um, that uh, told Serafina, yeah, Joel would be the guy to do it. You know, so Serafina got a hold of Joel. Joel was in it, into it, and Jeff Pills and another one, another great, great bassist. And I've had history with both those guys, you know, from, you know, Jeff obviously with Cinema and with Foreigner being on the road with Journey. And Joel as well, you know, with Night Ranger. It was Night Ranger, White, uh, this is Night Ranger, White Snake, and Journey in Europe. So we all got to know each other. So you know, you got Joel playing with Night Ranger and Dougie with with White Snake and me, and it, it just it was like a natural fit. They're great guys, and I think that's the that's the thing that I wanted the most. It's like okay, they they can be monster players, great greatest players in the world, but if there's you know they don't have that that thing. And Jack and Doug had that thing. They're just good, solid, sweet people. Good people. You know, no egos, no pretentiousness, just play your freaking instrument, tear it to shreds and have a great time. Joel and Jeff are the same. 
they cut their cut from the same cloth. So that worked out great. It's like, okay, that's the biggest hurdle. We have, we have, we've jumped that hurdle and the playing, it speaks for itself. I mean, those guys are both exquisite players, man. They're great at what they do. So it worked out really, really well. And I know that um, Joel started writing stuff um, with Alessandro uh, Del Vecchio, the, the house producer for Frontiers and was working on stuff and, and, they sent me the demos. I actually did two records in, <laughs> I think it was like 14 days. Wow. I did two of them because we had two of them in the can. So I was like, okay, let's do the drum track. So I did, let's see, we got 12. I did 23 songs in three and a half days drumming. I just knew the stuff. So I knew what I was going to do. I knew what the, what I was looking for. They knew. So they said, we don't even need to produce Dean on the drums. We know what he, you know, he knows what he's doing there. So I had Alessandro and Johnny Gioelli. Hardline. Johnny was the one that produced my vocals on these last two records. And Alessandro did it always in the past. He was always the guy that did it. Uh, but he had other commitments. So Johnny, we were Zooming, doing Zoom from him. And he was in Connecticut. I was in um, in Portland and, you know, got the screen up and we'd listen to the tracks and I did the vocals. I did, um, let's see, uh, one of the vocal takes, I mean, one of, one of the records. So we did two drum tracks, two records with drum tracks, one vocal in about six days. We're doing about three songs a day, you know, vocally. And thank God my voice held up. I was okay. We got it done. And then I just finished the second one, the second vocal, uh, the second record's vocals on the, when was it? We did two shows in, in with Journey um, in Oklahoma. I flew home. I did it the 29th, 30th, 1st and 2nd. Four days to do... 12 songs vocally, and then fly out the next day and do three shows in a row with Journey. So I was like nine days singing. My voice was hammered, bro. I was talking like that. But we got through it. We got through it. So yeah, it was it, the way that it all worked out, it, it just everything fit perfectly. And now we're going to do the, the the next one, the third record with Joel and Jeff in August, hopefully. Get that done when Journey's done off the road. So I'm trying to keep busy, bro. The more busy I am, the less time I have uh, not to do the don'ts, you know what I mean? If you got, oh, yeah. if you're too busy doing the do's, you won't have time to do the don'ts, and that's that's what I'm doing. What what drums you playing now? DW man, I've been I've been with DW now for gosh since uh, since '97. Actually, just before I got the journey, the the journey gig, I I signed up with DW. I'd been with uh, Sonar for many years, and I I woke up one day and everybody had left. Oliver, the the president's son. He uh, became a graphic graphic designer, so he moved on. John Dyke, the artist guy, he had left. So I was like, I didn't know anybody there anymore. So I just said, well, I called up DW, and they're like, sure. So they signed me up, and I've been with uh, DW now since 97. And um, I'm actually, um, I'm right in the middle of symbol companies. I've decided, because uh, I've been with Zildjian forever. I mean, Zildjian have been my dark horse. They're the ones, and I've loved them. They're great. But I decided this year, like, you know, to try some different stuff, but I can't try different stuff if I'm endorsed. You know, it's just not right to the company. So um, I'm I'm just trying out new things. I got some Pisces up. I've got some Minos symbols up. I've got um, some Diligence up, and I'm just trying different stuff. Like back in the old day when we oh, we tried this amp with this guitar and these strings, and that's what it feel, and it feels really cool because I'm I'm getting different sounds. Like, man, I love the minor on that. The the minor sounds so good on that, you know. And oh, that crash right there, that that signature Pisces sounds so good. And of course, you got the twenty one rock, you know, the twenty one inch crash ride, crash ride that um, the Ringo symbol. I love that one. So I'm just trying a bunch of different stuff out. But I'm still with DW. I'm still with uh, Evans Drumheads, Vader Drumsticks. You know, still doing the same stuff. Check it out. Somebody wants to say hi. Come oh my gosh, who is it? Come here. Oh. oh my god, dude! Gertie! Hey, Baba! Gertie. What's his name, dude? What's his name? Gertie. Gertie! Hey, babe! Say oh, hi, dude, I wish I had my pups. That's one thing. You know, I miss my wife, dude. But I miss my doggies, too, man. I miss my boys, man. Bubba and Louie. Those are my boys. I know. I saw... I, was, I did a uh, I did a two-month tour with Marcus King. I was opening up comedy and rock. And man, awesome. did I miss Gertie big time. Look, Gertie. <laughs> what a sweet. How old is she? She's six and a half. I got her during wow. COVID. Uh, 
my good friends over at Rose Flower Frenchies, uh, you know, gave her to me like a adoption and uh, Very nice, bro. just a lifesaver for me, you know? And Dude, I'll tell you that my guys are the same way. I, I miss them so much. It's really hard to be away from them. I mean, and I was hoping, see, I was hoping that if the routing was correct, I was going to get of my own bus and bring the family out and have my boys with me. But it didn't work out. I was like, no, the jet, we got to do this. There's a lot of hubbing and, and there's some long flights and stuff. So we're going to need to keep you around, you know, and I'm like, Dang it. But that would have been so great to have my boys out. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to see them, dude, until we hit hit uh, Eugene. When when Journey plays in Eugene in, um, God, when is it? Uh, April 17th. So I'm not going to see my boys. Are you playing L.A.? Are you playing L.A.? Are you playing L.A.? We're doing the closest we're getting is Palm Palm Desert. Palm oh, yeah. Desert. Yeah, we yeah I think, dude, if you want to come down, you let me know. I got you. I know people. Oh, yeah. I'll hook you up. <laughs> oh yeah, I want to. I want to come. Man. I want to come see you for sure. And um, come I do comedy quite a bit up in Portland, so hopefully we can hook up. I was just up there um, with Marcus at the Crystal Ballroom, and then I did the arena. I did the Trailblazers Arena with Burr. Dude, the Moda Center, nice place, dude. Oh, dude, the Crystal Ballroom is a badass venue. I love that place, man. Yeah. Love that place. Very yeah. nice. I know about Marty Freeman's playing there in like two weeks. He's got his little touring band, so he's going to be playing Crystal. It's a great venue, dude. Really nice. Yeah, let me know, dude. I'd love to come up. I'm a comedy freak. I'd love to. Who do you, you watch a lot of comedy? Who do you like? Well, you know, dude, I love Bill Burr. I think he's freaking awesome. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, you saw the Chris Rock thing. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talk about, I mean, talk about. Hitting the home run. And he did it the right way, man. He was smart about it. He didn't, he didn't play the victim thing. It was just, you know what? Good on you, man. I mean, that's that's a huge thing. I mean, to, to go through something like that, that that humiliation and come back the the better man, the the you know, the bigger man about it. So, you know what? When it's time, I'll address it. That was awesome. But I love Bill Burr. That that F is for family, one of the greatest. I love that show. I got my grandkids watching that, dude. And I know it's kind of, you know, well, yeah, but, but they're, it's okay. They're going to hear the word anyway. So yeah. he's brilliant. Bill's brilliant. I love you, man. And I can't thank you enough for making that uh, a long time ago, helping make that that gig happen for me as, at a young age. Well, dude, age. I'll tell you, Dean, you were great. The band was great. I mean, if you guys sucked, it would have been a little harder to do, obviously. But you yeah. guys brought it, man. And that was cool. I mean, it was like, you, it was a no-brainer. It was like, these guys fast, man. Come on, let's get somebody has got some balls up there. Don't, let's not get a happy band. Let's get somebody has got some nuts. Warm up the crowd. We need yeah. somebody to get in there. Punch him in the face a little. Hey, do me a favor. Tell Neil I said yeah. hi. Where I've, I've been wanting to get on the show solo because uh, we did the episode. If anybody's listening, I did an episode with Journey Through Time with Greg, Neil, and Dean uh, yeah. a few years back. So you can find that. I also had Greg Raleigh on last week. And Greg also did the show on the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. So if you want to hear a lot of great old Journey stories and Santana uh, these are some great episodes. And uh, tell Neil I said hi. Tell Neil I want. I will, bro. Hey, do you want me to get? Yeah, I'll get him. I'll get you in touch with Mikel. They'll get it hooked up, dude. Right now, I'll just text him when we're done here. One hundred. He'd love to talk to you, bro. You're a Bay Area guy. He'll love it. I'd love to talk to him, man. It'd be great. You got it, my brother. Hey, great, uh, great talking to you. Please stay in touch, and I'll come see you in Palm Desert. And. Uh, uh, can, uh, congrats for being back in the drum seat back there with Journey. Fantastic you, singing, and uh, you, oh my God, your your playing is just epic, man. Oh, epic. Thank you so much, bro. I appreciate you. You've always been there for me, even during my worst stuff, dude. You you stuck by me. I owe you that big time. I love you, Dean Del Rey. You're the badass. You are the real deal. Candles lit, my man. Oh, brother, I love you much, man. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> See you, Bubba. Take care, man. Keep in touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Okay, Bubba. All right.